back to Ground Zero Salem. I have returned from the left coast. Uh, right now we're listening to the Grind Crusher comp. Pick this up along my travels that I'm going to go into lurid detail about in a moment. Uh, went on a whole bunch of record shopping excursions with the one and only Eric Bauer. Uh, this has been talked about, I feel like, a fair amount on the, the VC. Uh, Wordvert talked about it, Eric, I think, talked about it too. I talked about it in my uh, top 20 that got me into death metal. This was the CD edition that kind of jumped out at me. Um, used to have this on tape. It was one of the very first things I ever got that opened the floodgates to get into a lot of music. Uh, I showed it off on LP before. This ha is an expanded edition. Uh, has World Eater by Bolt Thrower instead of Cenotaph, I think is on the other version. Um, I was driving around in a rental car that was very pretty nice, but its Bluetooth wasn't working, wasn't connecting to my phone. I needed a CD. And uh, it actually, when I think about it, syncs up really well with uh, a lot of the music I bought. Um, appropriately enough, I picked up a lot of crust. Got some pretty good recommendations for Krusty Hardcore from Eric, and I'll get into that. Wonderful visit. Um, great going out there with my family. Had a lot of had a lot of time during the day with my son while my partner in crime was at work because I went out there with her. She had work stuff. Figured I'd take out the take the opportunity to go uh, and visit Seattle for the first time since fuck like 2004. Great city. Lots of awesome record stores. Um, one thing I noticed that a lot of the record shops out there, there's a lot of indie chains that have like three or four locations that are massive and uh, have all kinds of crazy good shit like you'll see. We have a stack here. And this is just the LPs. I also have a handful of 7 inches and some CDs. I'll get all into that, but um, I was really impressed with the record stores in general. We've got some great shops in the Boston area. Of course, I've mentioned Armageddon, which is, you know, king of the hill, top of the heap. Uh, top shelf place, um, but a lot of a lot of the stores out of there were just massive, and there, you know, there's multiple locations and stuff. I'll get into that in detail as I go along here. The first place I went uh, was the second day I got there, all jet lagged and shit. Uh, I didn't intend to go record shopping that day, but you know, I happened to be waiting to meet up with my friend Yamiko, one of my friends from back east, a uh, friend of mine from Syracuse that lives in Seattle now, um, so I, I was scheduled to meet up with her, and, uh, you know, I had 15 minutes to kill, um, so I went to a place called Everyday Music, which has a whole bunch of locations, uh, a couple in Washington, one in Portland, and uh, I didn't even get into their metal section, but every single... It was alphabetized general rock, and every single letter of the alphabet had hardcore punk, you know, assorted. And there was a lot of 90s gems from, like, hardcore and crust and stuff. And a few things jumped out at me. I'm like, yeah, I'll buy that. And it, all of this was really, really cheap, which was great. Uh, I, first thing I grabbed was this black hand, 10-inch, pulling their strings, pulling your strings, rather. It came out on Scorched Earth Policy. Um really 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 cool it had an insert see I lose inserts I don't know it had an insert with uh, you know some other stuff that was on that label at the time um, J.R. Ewing and some other shit um, but uh, this is a four song EP came out as a demo first I think this band came out of uh, another Canadian band called Ire Ire was a lot more sludgy um, Black Hand is fast Rashy. I mean, you can tell it's like hardcore kids or punks playing it because it's got enough of that influence, but very, I want to say, at the gates, but before that whole Slaughter of the Soul sound was completely strip-mined. There's a lot of good, like, entombed His Hero is Gone kind of influences in there. Um, real thrashy, almost kind of dissection-y uh, as far as range of sounds that it kind of sounds like, but yeah, like, um, sharp melodic riffs here and there, um, sort of black metal-ish vocals, at a time when a lot of bands that came from DIY hardcore weren't really fucking around with that sort of style, partied on copy, I'm, I'm struggling to get it back in the sleeve, so I'm not gonna bother, like, mildew and fucking ringwear, but the vinyl's in decent shape, it's a little dirty, but it, it plays fine, crackles and pops, whatever, um, 
got this Brother Inferior LP. This was a band that was a pretty big deal in the 90s. They're from Oklahoma. Um, Sensual Underground Ministries. <laughs> the name of that label always kind of gave me a chuckle, but it's a uh, good, angry punk rock, um, hardcore punk. I remember the bass playing on this being really kind of outstanding um, for this band. I never owned this LP, I've heard it before. The split with uh, None of the Above, who I believe are also from that area of the country, is, is great and a classic that's been in my collection for a long time. Political lyrics, uh, detestation. Um, I haven't listened to this, and I used to listen to this all, all the time back in the day. Uh, I know that it's female fronted, and it has Kelly from the, um, Defiance playing in it. I know that it's kind of crusty and metallic, hardcore. Uh, I remember them being one of the better bands of this sort of genre back in the day. Um, this came out as a split release between Skulled, Consensus Reality, and Profane Existence. Printed in her sleeve there. Center labels. You know. There's a song on it called Circle the Wagons. This is long before the Dark Throne album, so maybe there's some influence there. I don't know. And then I made it out the next day. Met up with uh, Eric and uh, his wife Nana. Had a great time. Got some lunch. Uh, kind of caught up, the little discussion over, like, never met anybody from the YouTube universe in real life, and thankfully this doesn't feel weird, it felt completely organic, it's like we'd been friends, you know, like friends down the street for as long as we've known each other and not across uh, videos and IMing and all that kind of shit, so that was cool, um, brought the little guy along, and the first place we went was a place called... I got my bag there, Daybreak Records. This is run by a dude named RJ, who uh, played in the great 2000s hardcore band Sex Vid. Noisy hardcore, kind of influenced by Void and early Corrosion Conformity and stuff like that. Worth, tra worth tracking down if you're interested in that kind of stuff, by the way. This is Axeman Arrive. Came out on Darkest Heavy. Um, part of the whole Twilight Black Circle. Um, Members of Volon, I believe, 45 RPM, three song EP, uh, raw black metal um, with a strong Amoebix influence, so the atmosphere of it is more like akin to the, that sort of uh, despondent, sludgy, sort of stripped down simplistic thing that Amoebix had, that kind of magic, but mixed with black metal. Um, very cool. Aztec themed, like a lot of the stuff from the Twilight Black Circle and Crepusculo Negro. I used to have this on cassette, and it was a dub copy and, and almost unlistenable. I've heard this version, and it sounds considerably better, and the, the songs are great, so I'm really happy to have that. Uh, this jumped out at me. This has been a, a minor want of mine for a while, on and off, in and out of my um, Discogs cart for months now. I have the first one. This is the complete death comp on Death Records. The first one had a lot of bands that were already established. Uh, Cryptic Slaughter. Um, I think Hyrax, maybe. Uh, Mentors. As well as some unknown bands. This is mostly demo level bands that... Uh, I know Dirge got released on Death Records eventually. Um, Lethal Aggression had an album. I don't know what it came out on. It came out on... School of Violence had a full length, Anchor Watt had a full length, uh, but some of the other bands on here, El Chemicon, Hatred, Im Impulse Manslaughter had a full length, but this is all, uh, it seems to be mostly demo recordings of all these bands. Um, there was a promo that I thought I saved. It was on the shrink, I didn't want to leave it in the shrink. Big fat argh, promo sticker here. Complete Death 2. In the tradition of the Metal Massacre series, Complete Death 2 is a cross-section of 12 up-and-coming hardcore bands that offer varying styles. The music ranges from sheer intensity to satirical comment. 
uh, chosen for their comment on society. The bands on this compilation are sure to establish Complete Death as a landmark series representing hardcore punk metal attitude of the future. So, uh, yeah, I mean, th there's some great tracks on here. School of Violence is really good. Their full length had uh, Carl a Carl Agel, Eagle, who um, went to sing, went on to sing in Corrosion Conformity during the Blind era. Four Walls Falling is on this, which are kind of the sticking out like a sore thumb kind of band. They were like a political, faster, not straight up youth crew, but influenced heavily by that kind of stuff. Kind of band from uh, Richmond. Um, Hatred, who I've talked about their 7-inch before, uh, they, their demo is like a complete underrated proto-death, like repulsion kind of, you know, Dr. Shrinker, you know, kind of thing. The song on this is not like that at all, it's more like tepid crossover, which was kind of disappointing, I was hoping for more of that ripping stuff. Um, cool anyway, you know, yeah, cool comp. And this has been, I've seen this in shops and uh, on some vids, I think Aaron the Metal Theologian talked about it. I've seen it on a couple of people's videos on the DC. Um, Death Wish with Demon Preacher came out on GWR. I was always under the impression that these were Teutonic dudes, um, but they're actually British, it looks like. Ferocious stuff. Um, speed metal, um, ripping thrash. The vocals are more, I guess, speed metal, because uh, they're, you know, traditional kind of high-pitched, um, melodic, piercing kind of vocals. Uh, it's a ripper, though. Uh, drums, uh, the drummer is a, is a madman, and it gets almost to like a DRI, Hyrax kind of, kind of tempo. I spun one side of it, and I love it. Um, spun a bunch of these last night, even as bone tired as I was with jet lag and we got to the fucking car and the battery was dead and that was a whole nightmare you know it was a very tiring trip back um, but I, I was hell bent on, on spinning some records even if it wasn't all the way through for some of them um, going onward uh, we have back, <clears throat> Backwater with Final Strike this is another one that I, I've been wanting for actually years at this point I had MP3s uh, I think this is their second record. Their first record's also great. This is German, um, heavily influenced by Motorhead. Uh, if you like Tank, if you like Motorhead, if you like Fingernails from Italy, this is definitely your wheelhouse. Got that rumbly, um, going off the plot, doing its own thing, Rickenbacker bass kind of deal. The fast songs are rippers. The slow songs didn't really grab me the first listen. Um, they seemed a little bit tap like a little bit on the weak side to me but I haven't really given this much of a chance I listened to it a bunch years and years ago like maybe 10 years ago um, one thing that's great is this guy's fucking huge like m m Messiah Markle who guys in destruction who fucking metal afro if you look below in the collage I thought it was him for a second but it's actually a big tree that's how serious this guy's hair is but um Good record. Slow songs, I feel like, could be better. The fast songs are total face melter, so, which is rad. Um, just got that Rod's live LP a couple weeks ago, and this came out in 82. Um, what the fuck is this called? Wild Dogs. The original dog from hell, Cerebus. Fucking, I mean, you know, judging by how that live record's basically like a, a retrospective of what they'd done up to that point. I believe it was after this. You know, it's, it's good hard rock and metal, you know, uh, mid-paced, fist-pumping, lighter-flicking kind of shit, like I said. Um, dudes were from my original neck of the woods, from upstate New York, Cortland. The address is uh, Rochester, New York, on the back. You can see Rochester was crossed out because they got jokes. This was another one I had all the I had for a long time back in the day and, and played the hell out of and I haven't listened to it in God like 17 years or something. <clears throat> Extin Extinction of Mankind, baptized and shit. I did see these guys in Boston once in a basement at this place called the Berwick, which is a legendary venue. Um, 
these guys in Hellcrusher really carried the torch for, uh, you know, dark crust from the UK during the 1990s. You know, strong Amoebics influence, as you, as you can imagine, from just the layout and the font and everything, but there's a, a lot more of, like, a kind of thrash metal, death metal, grind kind of, kind of stuff going on. I know that they covered, uh, you know, Feeble Bastard when I saw them and I lost my fucking mind. So, yeah, that, this is a great LP. Uh, looking forward to getting reacquainted with that. Kind of from the same scene, uh, although across the, across the ocean in Ireland we have Pink Turds in Space. Greatest shit. This compiles, um... An LP, I think that was originally also called Greatest Shits, which is kind of confusing, with their split with a band called Sedition from Scotland, who were also really good. Um, there's the insert for you. Oh yeah, Scald also put out the uh, Extinction of Mankind. This came out on I don't know. Can't find a label here. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know what this came out on. But, um, anyway, this is great. Um, kind of an interesting cross-section of influences. Um, you know, pretty, uh, pretty influenced by a lot of the Crass Records stuff, lyrically and aesthetically. Um, but, uh, musically, it has some of that going on, but a more influenced by American hardcore, maybe even a little bit of early thrash metal, there's a little bit of, like, uh, that scrappiness that, like, the first Accused record has on this, and, I mean, these guys came up under the bomb, you know, imagine being a band like this in Belfast, where everything's completely sectarian, and, you know, very, very real violence, and death is looming over you, I was lucky enough to go to Ireland, and go to the Warzone Center, which was a DIY venue and slash cafe slash workshop place or whatever that these uh, guys kind of practiced out of um, in the 80s. And uh, that place was cool. Some of these guys were still around and hanging out. Um, interesting experience, especially because I, I was there right around the time 9-11 happened. Um, great record. Uh, they turned into, some of the members went on to be in a band called Bleeding Rectum. We're also a great hardcore band from there. Uh, Black Army Jacket 222 came out on Reservoir and Chainsaw Safety Records. This was a New York band that was around during the 90s. Um, while all that power violence stuff was kind of blowing up on the West Coast, you had all the slap of hand bands, Man is the Bastard, Spaz, Despise You, blah, 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 blah. The East Coast kind of had less of that going on. Our bands were good. We, we had great bands like Disrupt and Drop Dead and um, Devoid of Faith. But they were they were fewer and far they were fewer and far between and they also kind of had a bigger rift of like sound variation I feel like um, with bands that were kind of heavily influenced by you know maybe the, some of the earlier earache stuff Napalm Death more influenced by hardcore bands like Siege and Negative Effects you know um, very different from the the more mainstream side of the East Coast hardcore being sick of it all Madball. You know, biohazard, whatever. These guys were New Yorkers. I think they were from Long Island. It might be Staten Island. Um, and uh, they were really cool. Um, these guys in a band called CR, Compassionate Revolution, kind of held, you know, held it down for that kind of more grindy, fast um, hardcore. Like really, really fast hardcore was not much of a thing anymore in New York by the mid to late '90s. And uh, I remember when this came out, I definitely liked their demo better, and I still think their demo is the best thing they've ever done. They also did a split with Hemlock, who is a black metal band um, that Dan Wilker did with one of the guys from Villains, the band Villains, and uh, revisiting this again kind of briefly, just jamming records last night, it's just, it's interesting, it's just got more going on than your power violence. Um, hardcore grind kind of record. There's more slower parts. There's some weird kind of clean vocals. Um, it's, I think it's more of a grower, and I think with a little bit more of an open mind that I have nowadays, I'll probably appreciate this more. But for three bones at daybreak, it's hard to say no. Uh, up next, we've got a, a Japanese hardcore monster of a record, Crow Bloody Tear. 
bloody tear. I always wondered which. I don't know. Um, yeah, just blazing dark, metal tinged, scary, fucking Japanese HC right here. Band's got a ton of seven inches and in splits. Um, this was put out by Prank Records. This is a repress. I was informed by Eric when I was looking at this. I was like, well, the red one's a lot cheaper than the white one. Uh, and he broke that down for me. <laughs> Thank you, sir. But yeah, this is a great record. Um, I've heard it. Haven't spun it yet. But it came out a while ago. It came out in 2005. But uh, I'm not as well versed in Japanese hardcore as a lot of people. But I know that uh, Crow is pretty top tier. Um, okay. So... Oh, and at Daybreak, I also grabbed a few 7 inches. I'll just kind of rip through those real quick. Got this uh, Hellshock. World Darkness. Uh, I don't know what the label is. Not mentioned, but uh, Dark. You know, um, Crust, I guess. Kind of hardcore. Um, I remember this being a little bit more death metal, kind of having a little bit more of this early earache thing going on, Bull Thrower in particular, uh, but I haven't listened to Hellshock in years, and, and while they were at their height of popularity, I was kind of avoiding a lot of crust. Um, I don't know what, what trip I was on at that point, I think a lot of oi, um, but I knew I needed at least one of their records, because they were one of the best bands of that era. We got a Counter Blast, 7 inch here, Prospects. Um, this came from the ashes of a band called Gianks, and they're from Sweden, I believe. Big ol' poster. Um, this is a lot more like droney and sludgy. Uh, Gianks was weird, um, hyper fast hardcore with a lot of odd dark elements and acoustic guitars in weird places. And uh, Counter Blast is a lot more focused and um, kind of similar to like early Neurosis, like second or third record Neurosis when they started to get a lot more dirgy. Um, I had their full length for years. I actually actually saw their full length at Everyday Music and for one reason or another didn't grab it, but um, looking forward to checking that out. I haven't listened to them in years, so my description might be a little off. Uh, classic here, Disrupt, self-titled 7-inch on Crust Records. This must be a repress because it wasn't expensive. It was under 10 bucks. That iconic Rid the Cancer there. I mean, most people know Disrupt even if they're not that into this particular genre. They're pretty much like the cream of the crop for that 90s stuff. Um, yeah, just fucking discharge riffs, but a lot of, lot of kind of death metal stuff going on. Dual vocals, high and low. Uh, great stuff. They had... Their record uh, Unrest came out on Relapse. I believe they have a box set out now that has everything that I've kind of had my eye on. Um, yeah, just anthemic fist pumping stuff. Speaking of which, uh, after we left Daybreak, went to a place called Singles Going Steady, which apparently is uh, the longest running punk record store in Seattle, according to sources. And like a dickhead, uh, being a Bostonian on the West Coast, I bought a fucking Slapshot LP. <laughs> because I've been wanting step on it on LP, I had it on cassette ages ago. Um, I have back on the map, I have Sudden Death over time, but this was the hole in my collection I needed to fill. This arguably might be the best out of those three. Um, I kind of lean towards back on the map a little bit more, but this is great. This is when they tightened up their sound a little bit. Um, you know, got almost metal, speed metal tight, but not really musically. Songs are kind of, you know, range and, and speed all over the place. Like, most of them are relatively fast, but you got Hang Up Your Boots, which is like an oi rager. Um, a real stompy, crunchy number called In Your Face, which is a Boston Straight Edge anthem. Um, Chameleon, Step On It, the same vicious social commentary from Choke Jack Kelly. As you would expect if you know Slapshot, sandpapery, gruff, kind of oi vocals over fast, tight, hardcore, great ripping leads, uh, courtesy of Jordan Wood, guitarist. Uh, fucking just really, really great stuff. Um, nobody does it like Slapshot did, you know. I find, find like more and more bands are kind of trying to sound like them. 
nowadays, um, nobody quite did it like they did. Uh, just slowly filling out all my Crucified Mortal stuff. You know, great, great thrash metal, extreme thrash, bordering on death metal from Cleveland, Ohio. Talked about him before. You know, most people know Reaper from Heavy Metal Relics. This is his band. I've talked about that. And Pious Trilogy. Didn't spin this yet. On the other side is uh, Faith Extractor with Project Trauma. Uh, I saw Faith Extractor. They've been around for quite a while, I believe, but I saw them for the first time. Shit, when was that? Like two years ago, two and a half years ago, open for Incantation back in Syracuse. They were awesome and blew me away, and I, they've been in the back of my head as a, a band I need to pick up some of their stuff. Um, Guy Ash Thomas has been on Heavy Metal Relics a lot lately, showing off some really cool t-shirts and uh, his collection and his uh, Nerd Cave, which puts mine to shame. Uh, yeah, so I'm happy to gr finally get my hands on that. I'm not sure if this, I would think this came out on Hellset Bangers, but I don't see anything. Yeah, it's a Hell's Headbangers one. Um, Parasitic with him. Fucking real cool, weird artwork there. The Virgin Mary, Queen Ant. Very, very nice gatefold. Death Spot. Records, it looks like. This band is great. Um, if you look at some of the other bands that the members came from, they're a Richmond band. Um, you know, I wouldn't use the word surprising, but it's cool to see that there's a guy from Alabama Thunder Pussy and a guy from Avail, uh, somebody that was in Cannabis Corpse. Um, cool. Um, you know, musically, like in terms of like the music that's written and how it's played, it's it's almost thrash metal. It's got more of a hardcore vibe to it. Uh, very fast, uh, tight musicianship. Very dark. It's got a good organic sound to it. It doesn't sound processed, but everything's produced really well. There's the insert there. Got some serious fucking crust warriors. I think the Alabama Thunder Pussy guy's the drummer, but I'm not sure. Um, and this just kind of jumped out at me just because uh, I, I needed to give Trypticon another shot. Um, when this came out, I was working at a record store, and I had a, my chance to get into it, and I just didn't. Um, I listened to some stuff, and the songs were just so long that, you know, me and my uh, attention span, I was just like, nah, I'm, I'm just going to stick to Frost right now. But it's Trypticon, Milana, Milana Kazmata, <clears throat> ahem, uh, you know, I, I feel like most extreme metal people know who the fuck this is, but the, it's a double LP, it was used for a good price, came out on Century Media, um, awesome HR Geiger art, this is a split, recommended by Mr. Bauer, uh, Mikago and T. Split with massive fucking head wound. Um, Miami hardcore. Mikago NT I picked up because it was a, it's apparently dark, fast hardcore, hardcore punk with um, members of Torch and um, Caveman Cult. So you know, I figured that was worth hearing. Uh, I think he talked about another one of their records on one of his updates so, quite a while back, and it, it piqued my interest. It, you know, under 10 bucks, sign me up. Um, another band that has like a lot of cool members of other bands, and uh, if I were just flipping past this, I don't know if I would give it the time of day because I've seen so many variations on the skull with wings, you know, gizm kind of thing, and specifically with this font. I don't know why DB and Crust and, you know, all that kind of, all those kind of bands that use specifically this font. But it always just causes me to just kind of blank out and be like, I don't know. I think Disphere uses it, you know. But this is actually old. Um, it's from the late 80s. And it's uh, members of Doom, who are fucking the masters at that sound. Uh, it's got Bry from Doom. It's got uh, a guitar. The guitarist played in, um, he played in, 
I almost said filthy Christians because I al always get them confused with Sore Throat. They're from different countries. Uh, it's got the guitarist fr from Sore Throat who also played in Solstice, the Doom Band, which I was not aware of. And I have not spun this yet, but uh, Dig Your Own Grave, Reanimator, Terror Rain, Rights, question mark, no rights, exclamation point, um, Emotion Disposer. Got some great song titles. The first song is called Sludge Lord. So I'm not sure what kind of hardcore to expect, but I know it'll be fast. And uh, that's all I really need in my life. And uh, their drummer, Bry there, plays drums with several Zs. So, you know, it's good. All right, so uh, Friday, um, you know, I, I had most of my time I was spending uh, with my family, with my son, taking my son to museums and the zoo and stuff, which was cool. Um, I had a free evening where uh, Amanda wasn't tied up with work stuff, so I met uh, I met up with Eric again for uh, for dinner, and before that we met up at uh, another chain, another really good chain called Silver Silver Platters out in Linwood, which is a suburb approximately 17 miles north of Seattle. Um, and I wasn't expecting much, but this place was also fucking massive. Um, I only gave a, a brief cruise through of the uh, LPs, and I was I was all set. <laughs> Buying any more records, I didn't have any more room in that fucking record bag. But I picked up some CDs, and a, a bunch of them were like, oh yeah, I need that. Yeah, I've been wanting that. Um, one was uh, Nocturnus the Key. Um, I've owned this in several formats over the years, but I haven't really had it in my collection and over 10 years, I had it on LP, and I flipped it for some stupid reason a while ago. But driving around, um, BCAD came up, and I was like, oh, fuck, man, I need that again. Why did I get rid of that? And lo and behold, look what was waiting for me when I arrived. Um, you know it, you love it. If you know death metal, sci-fi themed. Mike Browning, ex-Morbid Angel. Um, band was kind of punching above their weight with... Uh, their forward-thinking ideas uh, as far as like their musicianship not quite being in lockstep with uh, their sort of ambitious songwriting, but I think that has its own charm. It works for it. Um, Storing the Manger, about going back in time in a time machine to kill baby Jesus. Classic. Uh, then we got Trinity by My Dying Bride, collection of uh, three EPs. Came out on Fierce, which I think was a, a subsidiary of either Noise or Peaceville. Probably Peaceville, because it's My Dying Bride. But, collection of a bunch of different EPs. Um, Symphonaire, Infernus, Et Spera, Imperium, Thrash of Naked Limbs, and I Am the Bloody Earth, I believe are the three EPs on it. Um, great stuff. You know, Doom Death got progressively more goth as they went on. Um, just some of the best shit of this genre ever written. And, uh, slightly further down the path in the same dark forest, they had the new Paradise Lost on sale, used for under ten bucks, and I couldn't say no. Medusa spun this on the car driving home to the hotel. It's really good. Flaming. You know, it doesn't sound like Lost Paradise or Gothic, but it's excellent. Um, it does have a significant amount of sound going back to those albums on it, um, but it's got some clean vocals and songwriting that almost brings to mind Typo Negative at their best, and I don't know, the vocals are, are not like the clean vocals that they did in the past that sound like James Hetfield, they're more like somewhere in the nether realm between Andrew Eldritch and, and uh, Peter Murphy, I'd say, um, kind of like Cleopatra Records kind of style stuff. When the vocals are clean, they're really good. Those those awesome, mournful, melodic... Nobody does those kind of lead harmonies like Gregor McIntosh does. And I'd recommend this, you know? I'd say at least stream it and see what you think if you haven't paid attention to this band in a long time. I know that their last couple of records were pretty solid, too. I've listened to them, but this is, I think, the best thing they've done in years. Um, nothing will ever be gothic to me, like the album, but this is it's pretty good. Pretty fucking good. And... Uh, on Eric's recommendation, this was a local Seattle black metal band in the early 2000s, In Memoriam, uh, From Misery Comes Darkness, have not listened to this yet, 
but I, uh, I'm always into checking out local bands and you know you might not have heard of if you're from outside the area. There's keyboards on this, so I don't know if it gets kind of you know orchestral or whatever, um, symphonic. But you said that they were one of the best bands and extremely under underrated, and I, I trust the man's opinion. Uh, then we got finally last CD, and finally I fucking got this. Lord Weird Slaufeg with Traveler. Um, if you don't know, which you should, it's uh, great heavy metal, um, melodic, crushing heavy metal with a strong kind of Irish uh, guitar style, kind of like, you know, Thin Lizzy kind of stuff. Uh, that cool kind of melodic noodling and uh, all sci-fi themed. I mean, this is based on a role-playing game. Um, you know, so it's definitely up my alley. Um, John, who I had on as a guest months and months back that I played D&D &D with, fucking loves this band and always talks them up. And I've listened to them plenty, but I didn't own anything. And I really try to stick with the stuff that I actually own to listen to. Like, I don't stream stuff that I don't own much anymore. Um, so I'm glad to finally have this in my hands. Um, yeah, that's everything. Long-ass video. But long ass, uh, long ass trip, man. Uh, thanks especially to to Eric and Nana for coming and hanging out. We all went out to dinner. They got to meet my family, and that's really cool when you can make connections like that sincerely and all that. Um, it, was, it was an awesome time. I'm still suffering from jet lag. I'm still recovering. Uh, I got one more day of vacation from my vacation before it's back to fucking work. But. Uh, I hope everybody out there is doing okay. I'm going to shut this off and watch Eric's video. Peace out.